I came because I thought the world was sweet, was filled with laughing song and dancing feet. Oh, even in that land before my birth, I knew her surging joy was calling me to earth. The words of one, a poet, who was beginning to hear the true tone of love, which had sent her into the world. And now, in incarnation, in a remote area of British Columbia, the processes of awakening began. Recently, seven friends gathered in a house in the mountains to the north west of Colorado Springs for seven days. I'm sorry, seven of us for four days. To allow a magnification of the tone of love, the true tone of love. Hearing the words, behold, I make all things new. This was our intent in being together. I was there with Ann Blaney and Bill Bayan, Linda Bayan, Pamela Gray and John Gray. And Suzanne Corr. Behold, I make all things new, was the experience we shared. I'd like to lead us on a pathway this morning, walking swiftly together, using some verses of poetry to carry us along the way, the upward way, the ascending way the way of love. After coming into incarnation, consider a man who is sitting alone in his room contemplating the wonder of what is beginning to unfold within him. And he thinks these words when oppositions all my hopes confound, when sometimes seeming wedded to all woe, when ceaselessly the storms of ruin blow and tumble my big castles to the ground, and when I hear the curfew's solemn sound, knell that a broken-hearted day doth go. Yes, and when I think of long ago, when loveliness was smiling all around, then in some solitary silent place, I hide away and sweetly meditate on some lorn verse, admitting nothing base into the mind. And then however great my sorrows are, this heavenly solace brings such joy that I forget all earthly things. Continuing along the way, long after midnight, and I close my book, and hear again the rhythmic silence of the room, and the spectral voices of the mirage world arise around this man, with thoughts and feelings of fear and loneliness, of lies and death. And the words he hears, that's the words he speak. Fear that myth of doom is conquered. Straight into his eyes I look. 
I count not past nor future anymore. Eternity is not to be, but is. And all is well. And I am part of God's metropolis of earth, of stars, and that more distant goal. Then dwelling with his volumes old and in his garret closed from all, vainly seeking there the golden secrets of this cosmic ball. Crammed with lore and learned madness, with his dream of golden light, golden light, gold, the substance of love and light, the truth, the true tone of love. Crammed with lore and learned madness with his dream of golden light, found a world of antique sadness in those books of parish night. Then from out his dingy garret, leaving all that lore and rhyme, walked he in the living air at sun peep in the August time. And then he wept for all the wasted years spent in that parish night, for he knew that now he tasted what he longed for, golden light. So the man is walking in the ascending way, and the light of truth begins to shine, and the heart of love begins to open, and he feels the exaltation of the tone of life ringing within and all around him. And late at night, this man often finds late at night great wonders open. How often have I in the sleepy night stirred up to put on paper 14 lines, hemming my wild thoughts in those tight confines. And yet they lilt their joy with feet so light I scarcely know the message I indite. Only I know that when the morning shines no halo round my lowly pillow twines and all the exaltations taken flight. For Psyche speaks, and she the clearer speaks. The more we are unconscious of the clay and out of self in that forgotten hour, then truths we have absorbed through days or weeks or years unfold as in a crystal ray like from the bud, the rose bursts into flower. And the man has the experience that what he thought was simply parish night was actually divine darkness. And there was much going on in the darkened space of the subconscious mind and heart. And there is that which was most useful taking place that he didn't have any conscious awareness of but continuing to move with the true tone of love and life, he discovers that the truths we have absorbed through days or weeks or years unfold as in a crystal ray, like from the bud, the rose bursts into flower. The same thing can be true, we said, of what it is that occurs in the whole body of mankind. In the deep subconscious of mankind, the parish night, it seems, but actually divine darkness. The light, the truth of love begins to blossom and much is brought to conscious awareness. So, these are just a few words to indicate something of the nature of the pathway as we walk in the way of the Master, the Lord of Love, 
the Lord of the fire. There's a great fire burning in the earth and in our own hearts. Fires of purification, fires of transformation. But centered in the true tone of love, conscious of the Lord of love, we're brought together in the spirit of behold, I make all things new in this moment. There was a man sent from God, a woman. There is a man sent from God. His name is John, and John will be speaking with us in a few minutes. And there is a man sent from God whose name is Bill, Bill Bayon. And Bill, such a joy to be with you this morning and pass the flame to you to carry us for further along the way of the master. Thank you, David, for the beautiful essences that are conveyed through your words. I am keenly aware that tomorrow, September 16th, marks the 87th anniversary of the inception of the Emissary Ministry and the initiation of the Third Sacred School by Yeranda in 1932. Here is a creative cycle that is at work in the whole body of mankind, regardless of how many people are consciously aware of it. David mentioned that a week ago, seven of us spent four days together in the Rocky Mountains near Colorado Springs, and the theme for our gathering was All Things New. We rented a lovely mountain home tucked into the side of Pikes Peak that was at an elevation of about 7,700 feet. From the living room and large back deck, there was a marvelous panoramic view of mountain peaks that towered above us. It was a glorious setting in which to spend this time together. The best way I can describe our gathering is that it was a time of sacred communion. We took turns reading transcripts of services and classes to each other that were given by our spiritual mentors, Lloyd Meeker, known as Yoranda, and Martin Cecil. We also listened to audio tapes and viewed some videos. David did a wonderful job of selecting the materials that we considered. The words we shared from these two men are as meaningful today as when they were first given. During or after each presentation, we took some time to share our thoughts and expand upon various themes. Our purpose for being together on earth at this time became vivid in my awareness. We are here to bring a new heaven, a sacred state that has not been known by mankind on any large scale for many thousands of years. One of the evidences of the new heaven is the experience of true friendship that we share. Here is a statement attributed to Albert Einstein. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. When man fell thousands of years ago, he lost consciousness of his true identity. In using the word man, I am, of course, referring to both men and women. The place of true identity has been described as having position but no magnitude and can be symbolized by the letter X, which is made up of two Vs. The upper V represents the heavenly dimensions of being and the lower inverted V represents the earthly dimensions. They both share the same apex. 
Man was created to live at that crossover point, at the apex, so that the heavenly essences of spirit can be conveyed into the world of form through his outer capacities. All things are made new as there is a return to the place of true being. Man's consciousness fell by reason of the attitude of judgment and emotional reaction to the external world. In this reactionary state, destructive spirits began to be expressed, which produced a veil in consciousness, the impure heart, a dark cloud, which has completely obscured man's awareness of his true identity at the crossover point between heaven and earth. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Life below the veil is very restrictive, a two or three dimensional experience. Whereas life without the veil is designed to be a seven dimensional experience. It's like the difference between watching the television in black and white and watching it in color. The fourth dimension of the pure heart is a window of heaven that connects the three heavenly dimensions with the three earthly dimensions. The whole world is contained in our consciousness. The darkened state of human consciousness below the veil has produced a world of illusions, a dream state, where problems are constantly being self-generated and begging for solutions. Valiant attempts are being made by mankind to resolve the issues of this world. But as Albert Einstein correctly stated, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. As there is a recreation in our consciousness through the purification of the heart, there is a recreation of the world contained in our consciousness. We see everything in a totally different way. There is a whole new perspective because we are letting ourselves return to the crossover point. This is how all things are made new. The restoration of fallen man is the restoration of man's consciousness to his true identity. The only way this can occur is to let the veil be dissolved, to let the heart be purified so that the oneness of heaven and earth is known in one's experience. As we know, the purification of the heart occurs by letting one's whole attention be centered in the expression of the true qualities of spirit. We are aware of a few opportunities that have been offered to mankind within the past 4,000 years to initiate the process of letting true consciousness be restored. There was the first sacred school at the time of Moses, and the second sacred school at the time of the Master, which both ended in failure due to inadequate response by those who were on hand to participate in the process. After the Master realized that the second sacred school could not be carried out successfully on a collective basis, he took it upon himself as one person to move through all seven sacred schools, all seven levels of consciousness, which involved the generation 
of finer levels of spiritual substance. It is said that the veil was rent in twain. The master opened a door for mankind by establishing a victory at every level of consciousness. As a result of what occurred in his experience, a vibratory radiation was released into the consciousness of mankind, which has been referred to as the true tone of life. This radiation of spirit has been working in the mass consciousness of mankind ever since that time and having a powerful influence. It provides the opportunity for clarification to occur at the level of the subconscious mind and heart so that man may let his consciousness be raised up to where it belongs. We are aware that this radiation of spirit working subconsciously broke surface through the person of Yuranda, who initiated the third sacred school, a spiritual expression plain approach. Here is the opportunity for a collective body of individuals to be returned to a true state of consciousness and to bring a new state on earth. It is only through a consistency of spiritual expression that the heart is purified and a person can be restored to the crossover point. There can only be movement into the fourth sacred school, the fourth level of consciousness, when the heart has been purified. And this has been one of the primary purposes of the third sacred school. There is an intensification of spirit occurring in these days. Those who let themselves be aligned with the spirit of God, the true tone of life, are raised up in consciousness to a whole new level of experience. And those who resist are cast down into a descending cycle. It's a matter of personal choice. We see this clarification process working out in the world of mankind, and we know that it has been at work in ourselves. One of the evidences of moving victoriously through the Third Sacred School is the experience of being in the world, but not of it. We are fully aware of everything that is happening in our world, both near and far, but it no longer has the power to grab our emotions and produce a reaction. That would only maintain the impure heart and the veil in consciousness. There is a stillness in mind and heart, a sea of glass clear as crystal, even though many things may be swirling around us, and there is a process of change working out. As we move forward in this recreative process, then we may be an example and an inspiration to others, a stable point of orientation, so that they can move in this process as well. Many times, this simply means letting our light shine so that others may see that there is a new state available to be experienced. I would like to close by sharing a prayer written by Martin Cecil. Whatever arises, let me dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Let there be a place of stillness in the midst of turmoil. Let there be a place of light amidst darkness. 
Let there be a place of ease amid disease. Let there be a place of order in the chaos. Let there be a place of love and beauty in the midst of fear and ugliness. Let my presence be a beacon of enfolding radiance in every circumstance. And so may we let it be. I would like now to invite our friend John to continue in our time together. Both uh, David and Bill, thank you both, um, mentioned this gathering that we were a part of uh, just last weekend. I found that the immersion into the, the total quality of expression of spiritual mentors we each knew back along the way evokes a, a very different experience than those who are not students, but leaders. And we found ourselves uh, meeting in a place our former mentors were coming from and experiencing a, a profound friendship among ourselves. Everything we considered was made new right before our eyes and in our hearts. What is it that works against human beings rising up into a, a new and true level of self-awareness? Here's one way of looking at that question. All of us as uh, human beings are born with a complex debilitating disease. It's ubiquitous. So much so that it is thought to be natural and normal. And not only is it a congenital condition, but it's communicable also. <laughs> a double whammy. We're all born with it and people spread it wantonly unknowingly, ignorantly. Oh, and there's uh, no cure known to man. This disease, the absence of ease, is a very incomplete and thus erroneous identity. Common symptoms of this illness of separation from life's larger design are greed fever, a dreamy delirium, and virtually total amnesia, prompting many to wonder, who am I? Why am I here? Other symptoms include fear, self-centeredness, shame, accusation, criticism, blame, hate, Delusions of both insignificance and grandeur. Despair. Depression. A wide variety of hallucinations and strong tendencies to harsh judgments, petrified opinions, and irrational acts. These are some major symptoms, and it's not a complete list. Obviously, this is a very serious condition. Everyone has it from birth, and contagion makes it worse. It's epidemic. Epidemiology, the branch of medicine that deals with the study of the causes, distribution, and control of disease in populations, is derived from the Greek roots epi, signifying upon or among, demos or demos, meaning people, and logos, denoting 
study, word, discourse. Put together, they mean the study of what is upon the people. If we study what is upon all the people, the human false identity syndrome, we recognize it to be pandemic because the condition is extensively epidemic worldwide. It's everywhere, in other words. The, the body of humanity is a single entity. Most people focus on the distinctions, the differences, which there clearly are. A cell in my heart looks and functions differently from one in my skin. But both are parts of my one body. The body of humankind as a whole is ill. Obviously, each individual cell in it is born, has its time, and then dies. Millions of births and deaths occur every day. But the whole body is sick. Symptoms may be more evident in some organs and in some cells than in others. But like it or not, we're all affected by the general human condition. We're all connected. Look at the planet from an astronaut's perspective. And it's obvious we're all on this spaceship together. And our living planet Earth itself is ailing in ways more critical than most care to recognize. Though those who do recognize the facts of environmental degradation, for example, tend to feel a mixture of desperation, hope, and despair about them. I feel grief and deep sadness about the state of affairs. None of us is exempt. In fact, Bill just reminded us of Einstein's no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. If we accept that Albert was very smart, as I do, his statement is worth examining more deeply, for it points to the only way to go, a complete shift of consciousness. Opportunities and inspiration to elevate consciousness have been offered to humanity throughout history and before. Yet the disease persists. False identity is pandemic. It is upon all people. It is so thoroughly endemic, most don't even know they have it. While there is no cure known to man at the level of consciousness that produces and maintains it, the condition can be overcome. Let's look at how. An essential initial recognition is that we're not merely human, products of our heredities and environment. We're human beings. Being activates the human. Without being, there is no human. Being is the source of life. I'm alive, a human might say. 
So evidently, there's a source of life present in me. Okay, that's a start. But the really big change in consciousness to come is from that of being a body, mind, and heart glad to receive the gift of life to knowing oneself as a spiritual being having a human experience. The latter is who we each really are. As we truly accept the opportunity, the inspiration, and the guidance that has been and is now personally offered to us, both externally and internally, being who I really am matures from theory into experience. My and our behavior springs from the character intrinsic to whatever identity we accept and know. As what's accepted is the, the real self, our experience of ourselves in consciousness is made entirely new. We overcome the disease of false identity. We'll discover more fully what that looks like as we do it. I read a, a news item about the Ebola epidemic in parts of Africa, which said that one of the most effective means per medical personnel have found to check the spread of this highly communicable disease is soap and water, frequent hand washing. Clean hands are a perfect metaphor for clean behavior in all we do. Clean hands are healing hands, helping hands. Contaminated hands do evil and spread it. Let us have clean hands and a pure heart. There is immaculate design evident in our facilities of divine incarnation. That's what our bodies are. Using them in ways contrary to their true design and purpose is at best ineffective. Actually, it's out of control and does damage. If I use my hand to try to drive a nail into a piece of wood, it not only won't work, it'll hurt. It is, it is written that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. There's the design. But what of true control? Physiologically, some evidences of divine control are evident to those who see. Blood and lymph circulate. Hearts beat. Lungs breathe. Breakfasts digest. Muscles coordinate. And myriad more life functions go on. almost all unconscious and unseen. Consciously, people tend to take the miraculous for granted. But we are awesomely and wonderfully made. Mentally and emotionally, true control is interfered with by reactions to externals. And the body pays the price. Our personal physical bodies, the physical body of humanity, and of planet Earth have no choice but to accept whether whatever is imposed on them by the character of consciousness that occupies them. We create the worlds in which we live. To believe otherwise is delusional.
there's no big evil power out there doing anything to us. If we function as designed to function and under the control of the one in whose image we're made, the world is surely made new in health and wholeness. In the process, we discover that individually we are quite large and creatively powerful. That our physical bodies are actually the smallest part of us. At almost entirely subconscious levels, life moves through individuals, through the body of humanity, and in and through our living planet. Were it not so, do you think any of this or we would be here? No. Grace and space have been granted to us and all to come out of the identity that produces the di diseased state. We individually, collectively, planetarily have been called into attunement with the tone of life. Let's answer the call with all our hearts. There's really nothing stopping us. Well, I think uh, I would invite others who wish to unmute themselves and uh, add to the conversation. Well, John, I certainly wish, and I would thank all of you for presenting your spirit of love this morning, whether we could hear it or not. And I thought the glitch in technology was a good reminder that we need to go beyond the physical, the earthly, because I think there's going to be a lot of disruptions in the earth in the days to come. We, we see them all around. There are a lot of disease and disruptions in the earth. But that golden substance of love, that's what needs to cover the earth. And I know for me, the only way I can do that in a greater sense is in my world. Whatever the opportunity, let the golden substance of love be there. Don't listen to the disruptions, but listen with the eye of the heart, the ear of the heart, and stay true to that, our incarnation agreement. Thank you all. Thank you all. John, this is Joyce. I would love to follow Pamela. Um, this is my world. We can all say that. We look out and we see a world. I think what you have all brought is what do we see? What does that world look like? There's the disease state, but there also is another healthy state which is the state of love that Pamela was speaking of. And I find increasingly that I love this world. I love this world. I love those who populate my world. I love them. I can see them. I can see struggles. I see, can see disconnection. And I see how unnecessary that is. And I see my responsibility as one cell in this beautiful world that I am charged with to bring a sense of the light. 
that David so beautifully expounded in his poem of a true identity that we stand in the light. And as our consciousness begins to clear, as we make space for this true sense of who we are, things get lighter, things get brighter. And I celebrate the brightness that I feel through all of your words of the spirit of the one I am. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. I would like to sing a song, My Heart is Overflowing. We have come to offer thy blessing, thy holy dwelling place on earth. Yes. Yes. Our powerful beings. The song tells us that tone. We have, despite this diseased uh, malady of mankind, we have capacities that are powerful. Why is this? Well, for one thing, there is the, uh, what do we call it, the um, law of attraction. Whatever I think, whatever I speak, whatever I act upon, it's uh, seen by the universe. And for better or for ill, that is a powerful thing. And hence... I have a respect and a protection of these capacities, of this expression, of this manifestation. And uh, every minute is a honing for the washing of hands and the purity of heart to let this word be spoken on the earth amidst the 
sturm and drawn amidst the fuss and bother, amidst whatever distraction we have, there is a responsibility to let this power of heaven be one with earth. So what a privilege. And you gentlemen have spoken of that this day. And I have utterly been grateful for what you've been and brought. Thanks very much. I, I note on the screen that uh, Bill Band's been reconnected and is with us. If you'd like to add anything further, Bill, I'd invite you to do that. Well, as Pam said, uh, even if we lose connection technologically, there's always a connection. We know that we, we stand at the connecting point between heaven and earth. We're here to convey this into the world. And how powerful that is when there's a collection of individuals who have an awareness of this and are letting it happen. So I'm sorry that we lost connection uh, through the internet, but I was here the whole way through and I'm glad that we're all together. There is a very strong connection and it's great to be together in what we're doing today. Great. Well, there may be others who wish to say something, but I, I also note our time moving along. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, David, for what you've both offered. And thank also everyone who has added both their voices and their, their current observers to what we've been hearing. You know, these, uh, to a lot of people, these are very fearful times unknown things afoot, whatever. There seems to be a lot to be afraid of. And, uh, you know, part of the apparatus of our physical bodies uh, reacts to that, reacts to fear. The fear is pretty contagious itself. It seems to take no time to spread through human emotions collectively. Uh, we have an amygdala, a part of our brain that uh, is sometimes referred to as a, a, a primitive portion of the brain. It's the flight, flight, fight, free, freeze, appease, I guess that's how it's described. Those are the responses. And then <laughs> I heard something on NPR where they were speaking about Amygdala is like a smoke detector. I thought it was a cool analogy. Most of our houses are equipped with smoke detectors. We want them to sound an alarm if our house is burning, but uh, leaving the toast in too long can set it off too. So this person who was speaking on the radio said, I keep a broom handle handy ready to poke the button on the detector to stop the alarm when it's a non-emergency. But that was a good point. That was as far as the speaker took it, but uh, can we poke an internal button to pause when there's a feeling of reaction of any kind, fear, whatever? And I think we can do this at least I find this helpful, is simply by asking a question, oh, is that so? Is that so? You know, it's usually not. Over. Anyway. Hey, John, can I say a word? <laughs> John, can I say a word? Yeah, please do. I just wanted to come back to the few verses of poetry that I opened this time with. 
I came because I thought the world was sweet, was filled with laughing song and dancing feet. Oh, even in that land before my birth, I knew her surging joy was calling me to earth. And the title of this poem is called My World, My Land. Isn't that what Joyce spoke so beautifully about? My world, the earth is the Lord's, I am my land. Deeply appreciate all that's been said, and I appreciate what Joyce brought to focus. Here's the last lines of that poem. Then deeper life is burning in my soul. There is no dream too sweet to dream, no goal too high. For all the magic, all the rare exotic charm, she promised, all is here is dwelling in this world. Heaven and earth made one, as Pendel said, is dwelling in this world, is here right where I stand. And I in wonder say, this is my world, my land. Spoken by one who comes in the name of the one who owns it all. Over to you, John. Great. Well, thank you, David. I think that provides a, a, a perfect conclusion to this night together. Thank you all for being together.